Good afternoon. Welcome. This is the panel on Leadership Reimagined, African-American Women Shaping the Future of America. We're happy that you have joined us here this afternoon, and we think that you will enjoy the panel that we have for you. Before we get started with the panel, we would first like to acknowledge our sponsor and say we are very grateful for the sponsorship of Thomson Reuters. And we have representing our sponsor today is Sharon Sales Belton. She's the Vice President for Strategic Partnerships and Alliances. Ms. Belton. We have Ms. Belton. Hello. Hello. Thank you uh, for the opportunity to bring greetings to the workshop attendees. I wanted to begin by thanking you and your leadership for your leadership and your service uh, to our communities across the country. Thompson Reuters is proud and honored to support you and your leadership in law enforcement and your commitment to lead police reforms at the national and the local level. Your voices are needed and they must be heard. You are all role models to thousands of African American and black children across the country. And many of our young people see you in these leadership roles and aspire to follow in your footsteps. The women of NOVA are at the forefront push, pushing for reforms and we all, we all know are so desperately needed in the justice system today. You understand that law enforcement must be accompanied by community investment. We need prevention and intervention initiatives that do not put band-aids, band-aids on chronic and persistent problems in our society. I want to assure all of you that you have Thompson Reuters support in bringing about the real, the lasting and transformational change that we all know is so desperately overdue. Now, many of you know that Thompson Reuters has been a longtime supporter of Noble. But I'm not sure that many of you are aware that when the tragic death of George Floyd took place here in my community, Minneapolis, my boss, Steve Rubley, reached out to the Noble executives to see how we could help. We are proud to have volunteered the expertise of our marketing and our communications team to assist Noble in leveraging its efforts to build support for the real lasting change in law enforcement across the United States. We are proud to stand with Chief Davis and the Noble executive team in this work. Chief Davis and also Mayor Contrell, who's on the panel today, I want you to know that I can relate to you and your experiences as black women championing change. Back in the early 1990s, I ran for mayor of the city of Minneapolis. The city had never elected a person of color or a woman to an elected administrative office. But with help, I broke the glass ceiling and I broke it wide enough for other women to get through. Women in all fields are seizing this same opportunity that has been historically denied to us. You are a part of that leadership and we are so proud that you are in the roles you hold today. Let me conclude by affirming something that we have known for a long, long time. And that's that women get things done. This is a great opportunity for African-American women to bring our passion, our conviction, and our fortitude to the public square and fight for liberty, justice, and equality for all. I'm looking forward to listening to what I know is going to be a fabulous panel. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks, Mayor Belton, and thank you for the sponsorship. And we look forward to, if you have any comments, giving us some comments, because you sat there in the chair of being a powerful Black woman. My name is Elsie Scott. I am the former executive director of Noble many, many years ago. I am presently the director of the Ron Walters Leadership and Public Policy Center at Howard University. And uh, I'm very thrilled that I was asked to serve as the moderator today on this panel on Leadership Reimagined, looking at African-American women who are shaping the future of America. 
You know, it's a very interesting time in America when you have so many black women that are sitting in positions of power. And one thing we can say that they are really making us proud. Women who are serving as mayors, attorney generals, as police chiefs, as sheriffs, as county executives, et cetera. We are very pleased that they are meeting the many challenges that are out there today. And we know that it's not easy because we see some of the pot shots that people are placing on them. But we are very proud that they are staying the, uh, staying the course and they are going to be sharing. We have three of those women sharing with us today who will share their insights, their experiences, and some of the strategies that they are using in order to provide leadership in their positions. So let me introduce our panel today. Okay, we have three panelists today and our first panelist needs no introduction because she is your president, the president of Noble, Chief C.J. Davis from Durham, North Carolina. Thank you. Thank our, you. Welcome. Our next panelist is Mayor Cantrell from New Orleans, Louisiana. She is the first African-American woman mayor in New Orleans. And she was our host mayor last year when Noble came to New Orleans. Welcome, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. And we are also pleased to have with us the Attorney General of the State of New York. She is the first woman of color to hold that position in New York. And she is the first woman to be elected Attorney General in the State of New York. Welcome. That Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't call her name. Tish James. Uh, Letitia James, better known as Tish James. And uh, she's a graduate of Howard University, where I work. So I have to put that plug in. <laughs> okay, we have some questions that we want to start with because we want to leave some time in order for the, uh, the audience to, uh, to ask your questions. But I want to start off. I'll start off with Chief Davis since she's, she's the president here and shoot the first question to her. Chief Davis, you grew up being intrigued, uh, looking at uh, police shows and even seeing a few women in those police shows. And so you had an interest in law enforcement, but you were a military child and you were concerned that your mother would not approve of you becoming a law enforcement uh, officer but she did approve. So I'd like for you to just reflect a little bit on how did uh, your life and career journal journey lead you to where you are today. And as you all answer these opening statements, you can also say in the introductory things that you want me to say that I didn't include in the introduction. Well, thank you. Well, Ellen. Um, it is always a pleasure to uh, partner with you. Uh, as a longtime icon of Noble, I really appreciate your support as a leader in Noble and leader in our community and, and education as well. So thank you. And you have a good memory, Dr. Scott, about some of the um, highlights of my background. You're absolutely right. I was a, a military brat, so to speak. And, um, you know, I, I grew up in a paramilitary or military kind of environment. So uh, a transition into law enforcement was something that I didn't think was um, that big of a deal. But as a as an adolescent growing up, you know, I was intrigued uh, about anything criminal justice. You know, throughout uh, my teenage years, uh, I had an affinity for anything dealing with crime scene investigations, anything dealing with police stories. And uh, some of those individuals that were on the screen back in the day when women weren't um, you know, uh, taking on those kind of roles. I was really, really interested in those types of, of careers. So, of course, my parents, um, they didn't agree with it, but eventually I, I decided to make that move and join uh, the Atlanta Police Department. But throughout my journey as a police officer, um, I tried to take advantage of 
used every opportunity that I could to learn more about the career and really to matriculate to higher positions in law enforcement. But I have to give credit to all the folks that were along the way. I got to great tutelage from so many wonderful mentors, and a lot of them came out of Noble. And um, it was inspired in so many ways. Um, I remember one of my college professors saying, learn something about everything. So that's sort of the way my career went. I was trying my best to learn something about everything as it related to criminal justice and being just uh, a, a, a sworn person that was informed beyond just what I could do on the street, but also in leadership positions. So thank you for giving me an opportunity to share. So how did you leave? Durham, how'd you leave Atlanta and make it to Durham? So I believe it or not, I got a call from a noble member. It, this was a person that was a noble member. We saw each other at a conference and he gave me um, information about the position that was opening up in Durham. At the time, I wasn't interested in leaving Atlanta. I was coming close to the time for retirement and I just, it, it, it just didn't phase me that, you know, um, moving and becoming a chief in another city was an option for me. And then I got two more calls as, as that position opened up. And, uh, you know, I sort of talked to my husband about it. We had purchased a house that we thought was going to be our retirement home. And he said to me, he said, you know what? He said, you've prepared your whole career for this. He said, so, um, you know, let's go for it. And um, I went through a process. There were 57 um, candidates that applied for the position. And uh, I kept getting calls that I was in the, the top 20, the top 14, the top five. And that's sort of how things matriculated. So here I am in Durham. I've been here for a little over four years now. Time has flown by. But um, it's been a, a good transition for me. Thank you. Next, we want to hear from Mayor Cantrell. Okay, so. Wait, let me, let um, well, <laughs> okay. okay. Just, I, I want to bring you on the right way now. Okay. okay I didn't. Hear. Okay, you are the mayor, the first black woman mayor of New Orleans. First female. The first woman mayor of the city of New Orleans. And you are not the child of a mayor, a former mayor like Mitch Landrieu was, or like Mark Morial was. And you are not a native of New Orleans. And so knowing New Orleans as I do, I want to hear how did you how did you come to be mayor? How did your life and career journey lead you to where you are today professionally? Okay, well, good afternoon and thank you to the Noble family. Um, really enjoyed hosting you all in the city of New Orleans on last year and, uh, and even being able to participate uh, as we are moving through this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So thank you. Uh, my journey, I would say, uh, did begin in Los Angeles, California, where I was born. Uh, and I left there at the age of 18 to attend Xavier University of Louisiana. But I was uh, reared um, primarily by my grandmother and I was with her going to community meetings and the like. And by the age of 13, I found myself being the secretary of our local chamber of commerce, which in that capacity taught me that I had a voice uh, and a voice that changed even how black students at my high school were uh, initially were not being contacted by guidance counselors to put us on a path to even go to college. So I learned early about my voice, uh, always grounded in community, came to uh, Xavier University, got involved, uh, of course, uh, just learning the city, um, seeing the uh, disparities that exist even in our city, but also real glimpse of, of, of life and hope through the people of this great city. Um, I got married here in, in 1990. And my husband and I purchased our first home in a neighborhood called Broadmoor. And I got involved in the community there, uh, started a neighborhood organization that ended up being uh, asked for me to join the larger uh, neighborhood uh, organization. So moving people to the, the larger table, I would say. But my community of Broadmoor, uh, like 80 percent of the city of New Orleans uh, after Hurricane Katrina was damaged by Hurricane Katrina. And my community was slated to not return, um, to become a drainage park. 
And so I'm quoted as saying all hell broke loose because um, I worked with my community, organized it, and we became a, a global model for post-disaster recovery uh, in the United States of America where three case studies are being taught at the Kennedy School of Government right now. But it's that grassroots organizing, kind of meeting people where they are concept, uh, being boots on the ground. Um, I was encouraged to run for the New Orleans City Council when a seat became open um, and it needed to be filled. So I was encouraged by the residents that I had organized and uh, ran uh, for city council against uh, the political machine, if you will, um, was able to be elected. I, and it was a district seat. I served in that capacity for six years. I filled the seat for two years and was reelected without opposition. So I went forward um, and served a full term. Um, and after uh, city council, I was encouraged uh, by the community to run for mayor um, and was elected the first uh, female mayor in our city's 300 year history. And again, um, you know, not having the backing of a political machine, the people of this community decided that their future was going to be female. And, um, and, and, it, and it definitely uh, was. Two women made it to the runoff, me being one of them, um, but that excelled. So uh, here I am, mayor of the city of New Orleans, and not one day even thinking about being uh, an elected official from the city council or even the mayor. But you know, when you just focused on doing the right thing and serving people, God has a way of putting you in positions and sometimes in those positions, you're the first. Absolutely, absolutely right. And our third panelist we wanna hear from in the way of an introduction is Attorney General Tish James. Now, Attorney James, Attorney General James, you're the first woman of color to hold a statewide office in the state of New York and the first woman to be elected attorney general. You graduated from one of the few law schools located at a historically black university, and that's Howard University. So some people would raise the question as to how did you end up being attorney general? You had started off in some sort of political career being on the city council of uh of New York and then becoming public advocate. But now you manage what some people say is the most powerful attorney generalship in the country. So how did your life and your career journey lead you to where you are today professionally? Unmute, uh, unmute. Thank you, Dr. Scott. And um, it's an honor and a privilege to join um, uh, to join you, to join uh, Chief Davis, the noble president, and of course, Mayor Cant Cantrell. Uh, she and I have served on a number of panels over uh, this last year and a half as I've uh, uh, served as attorney general. Um, we all know that it's true that uh, black women have saved our democracy. They've been powerful and indispensable in every aspect of our society. Um, for far too long, we've been marginalized, we've been ignored, uh, but now we're stepping into the light. And thanks to a global black women's rights movement and the commitment of organizations like, Glo like Noble and so many other sororities and, and, and sororities all throughout the country, more and more black women are claiming the power um, and changing the world. But we all know that black women have been behind the scenes of so many organizations, including the civil rights struggle. Uh, they have been the impetus of the movement. Black women have been very active in our churches as well as our civic organizations all across this nation. And uh, it is black women, obviously, who have been in the forefront of change all throughout this nation. And I'm pretty much, um, I'm hopeful and prayerful that soon we will have a black female vice president of these United States, um, because we do know that it was black women who propelled Joe Biden um, to be the Democratic nominee. I'm proud to share this moment with women with all of these three exciting and beautiful and powerful women um, as we focus on issues that affect communities of color, including um, policing, equal justice, systematic inequalities, and the current debate with respect to uh, police reform. Uh, the wisdom and leadership as uh, guardians of the rule of law has never been more uh, necessary. Um, and let me say that um, 
Uh, for 44 years ago, NOLA was founded with the purpose of ensuring that everyone in law enforcement has an equal shot at leadership and that equal justice is guaranteed to all the people that they serve. Under the brilliant leadership of uh, Chief um, Davis, Noble continues to lead the charge for change. And I wanna thank Noble for all that they are doing, not only across this nation, but including the leadership of Noble here in New York State. I am the first African-American woman who has won statewide office and the first African-American woman who has won citywide office as well. A former city council member who ran on a third party line um, in the aftermath of, the tra of a tragedy. Um, and then went on to serve in the public advocate's office, which is a citywide position, second to the mayor. And now as attorney general of the state of New York, where my focus is on sweet and simple justice, which I learned in the halls of Howard University Law School. Um, I recognized early on um, that it was really critically important that more people of color uh, serve on all levels of government. It's important not only uh, for um, the United States of America, but most importantly for young children, young children who look like me, young girls who look like me, to know that they've got the power within them and, they, and that they should step out of the shadow and into the light and claim um, their victory and raise their voice uh, and focus on issues affecting communities that for a long time have been left out of the sunshine of opportunity. That's what I do each and every day. It's an honor and a privilege to serve as the Attorney General of this great state of New York. And it's an honor and a privilege again to get sweet justice on behalf of my community. Thank you. And now I want to ask a couple of specific questions to each of our panelists and then we'll come and get more some a more general discussion. But for uh for Mayor Davis, I'm sorry, Chief Davis. I'm raised, I'm, I'm elevating you to a mayor. <laughs> Chief all right, Davis, all right. when you ran for second vice president of Noble, I know you did not anticipate that during your term there would be a pandemic and there would be protests around the country and there would be all this discussion about race and people would be just sort of wondering where do we go from here? But during your tenure as president, you have held the reins of the organization. So I'd just like for you to share a little bit with the membership about some of the initiatives that you have been working on representing Noble in many of the national forums that you've been called upon to uh, participate in. Um, thank you, Dr. Scott. Uh, you're absolutely right. As um, I took over the helm of this organization, we only had a few months of just a, a sense of normalcy as uh, we ended out the 19, uh, 2019 calendar year and moving into uh, January, we started January, February, we started to really see um, the influx of cases of COVID-19 and realizing that, that uh, Noble's annual uh, year uh, for myself and the officers uh, on our board would be very different than what we traditionally knew. But, uh, you know, as women, uh, we often know how to back up and punt. And anytime we're faced with a crisis, we start thinking in terms of what is the contingency plan. And most of us already have a contingency plan somewhere in our pocketbook. You know, when you run out of peanut butter, then you open up the SpaghettiOs. When you uh, don't have uh, money for gas, then you, you go look in a piggy bank. So we're always uh, planning for the clouds on the horizon. And what we decided to do was to start thinking in terms of what our community needed as it related to a response about, about COVID-19. And we started our CARES Act. And then shortly after that, we had the um, incidents that occurred across the country that ignited the country um, as it relates to the um, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, and uh, George Floyd incidents to amongst, uh, amongst others that really incited a response uh, from community members, from people of all walks of life and, and various demographics. And so Noble immediately started working on what is our message? What is our recommendations? This is a window of opportunity for us to be heard and for us to be amplify our voices you know, when no one else in our industry was probably more suited at that time to share the conscience of the community and to demonstrate a level of empathy about what was occurring than Noble. So what we did was we began communicating with our legislators 
about what policies needed to be changed. And Dr. Scott, you know as well as I do that Noble has been in this space for many years, since 1976. However, we weren't as strong in numbers to push some of the legislative recommendations that we've had in the past across the finish line. So our past presidents have been hard at work to have moments like this. Some of the initial recommendations that we made were very clear to us, especially as you think about the George Floyd situation. Some of the immediate failures were failure to intervene, failure to de-escalate, failure to render aid. You know, and then, of course, we thought in terms of, you know, the history of officers who have uh, committed egregious acts over and over again. Why does this continue to happen or why do these individuals continue to work in an industry that we all are, are sworn to uphold uh, and, and, and ensure, you know, um, the absolute best for our community members? So we also uh, recommended national standards. Um, a national database so that we can keep up with police officers who have committed egregious um, acts against communities of color so that they can't go from one um, agency to the next and continue to work in this industry. And then we also looked at um, qualified immunity and, and how qualified immunity needed to be reviewed so that we could ensure that officers didn't slip through the system. So Noble made several recommendations and you know, we were able to take opportunities before the House and the Senate to share our recommendations. And several of them are incorporated in the Justice and Policing Act, which is uh, now on the table to be evaluated and voted on. So um, as, as it said before, Dr. Scott, you mentioned it, that Noble has been in this space dealing with uh, lots of research on use of force and use of force recommendations as it relates to chokeholds and banning chokeholds and many other um, issues that at this particular time in our history is a pivotal time. So that's where we sort of shift gears, recalibrated and began working to be out front and ensure that our members had that messaging and that they were a force multiplier as well as it relates to what our communities need for meaningful reform. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Mayor Cantrell. Yes, Dr. Uh, Black women mayors have been out in the forefront with this pandemic. And you all, some of you have been attacked by the administration uh, and, and the leadership often has not been coming from the national level, but you were one of the first cities to get hit with the uh, effects of the pandemic. I wonder if you would share a little bit about some of what you had to go through, uh, what some of the leadership challenges and things that you were able to accomplish during uh, when it was the heart of the crisis, because we know the crisis is still with us. Yes, yes, ma'am. Uh, well, uh, Dr. Scott, uh, the city of New Orleans really uh, began to um, see us emerging as a hot spot right around uh, March of, of this year. And um, as it was becoming, I guess, something that we definitely needed to respond to as it relates to the positive cases, right around March the 9th, um, I had to uh, make that decision to cancel uh, parades in the city of New Orleans. And particularly uh, this particular weekend that I'm talking about, we had our um, Super Sunday uh, um, happening, which is our uh, Mardi Gras uh, Indians that mask, you know, every single year. And this was a big, big deal in our city. Also, um, the St. Patrick's Day uh, parade was, was planned. It's a big thing, you know. And so I had to cancel uh, those events and any other large gatherings in the city of New Orleans. And with doing so, uh, was met with a lot of criticism. I had, you talk about at the federal level, well, I'm talking at the local level. Mm -hmm. um, I was uh, criticized by uh, even a lieutenant governor who said, you know, publicly, oh, I made the wrong decision and that sort of thing. But again, being very focused on the public health of this community, uh, we uh, was a hot spot. Um, we have lost over 500, 548 uh, people in our community have died. We have over 9,700 positive cases, but out of that 548 um, of our people, 
you know, well over 420 are African American. So absolutely seeing the um, disparities and the disparity gaps in terms of how COVID hit us. And we came into COVID, you know, at a deficit, meaning with those disparity issues, but at the same time, just doing what it, what was necessary uh, to go into um, our areas, particular neighborhoods that were, um, we really needed to deal with, whether it was our Latino community, where we saw uptick as well. Of course, um, taking mobile testing sites to the community, not saying, oh, you need to go another place for it, but hey, you step outside your door and we made it accessible. Uh, we were able uh, to stand up even some federal resources really quickly. Um, and we flattened the curve by 96% uh, in the, the city of New Orleans. And now we've regressed, regressed just a bit. We're at 80, a little by about 80% in terms of flattening. And I had to make some more uh, decisions relative to restrictions to ensure that our kids um, get back in that classroom and on-site uh, instruction, but they will be starting with distant learning. But I tell you, uh, making the decisions uh, are, were necessary, being consistent with the public and being very open and honest and transparent about what our existing conditions were and not wavering uh, when it comes to the public health of the, the people of this great city. And, you know, I, even with businesses, for the business community, for example, I had um, a businessman from another parish, they got together and took out a full page ad in the paper, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I said, well, and had to make sure that um, I stated that I would not be bullied, you know, as a comes to making the right calls for the people of this community. And that has been disproportionately impacted. So we are now an island almost in the state of Louisiana. Um, and meaning that we're doing well, we're holding steady. We don't want to regress, uh, but now other parts of our state, 45 other parishes are now uh, suffering. And yes, we are helping every way that we can. Thank you. When I saw them attacking you, I said, they don't know who they're messing with. <laughs> she, will, she, will make, she will stand her ground. <laughs> okay, thank you. Attorney General James. You know, in, in New York, York. we've got 25,000 New Yorkers who have died from COVID-19. We also know that it has disproportionately affected individuals of color and particularly senior citizens. And third, we've seen the high unemployment rates here in New York State, um, and uh, it's particularly had a major impact on communities of color. We have uh, been successful. Um, we've worked with the governor of the state of New York. We've bent the curve, and we have not seen a reoccurrence of uh, the virus. However, we are seeing a slight increase between uh, of a slight increase for individuals between the ages of 20 and 30. Um, primarily, it has to do with the fact that uh, young people um, have thrown caution to the wind. Uh, a number of them have patronized uh, our bars and our restaurants uh, without exercising, social distancing, without wearing masks. And unfortunately, we are seeing a slight, slight uh, uptick in numbers in that population. And we are trying to get a handle on it uh, by, again, uh, not reopening um, as quick as we, as fast as we originally anticipated. Um, and um, uh, again, all of us speaking uh, of the same accord, and that is uh, uh, wearing a mask, social distancing, washing your hands, um, and staying at home as, as much as you can, particularly in the city of New York, which has not fully recovered and is not fully reopened. My office um, in New York City, we've got 16 offices all over the state of New York, but the main office is located in the city of New York. Most of the employees in the cities in the Manhattan office are working from home remotely. We've not missed a beat. Uh, we've been very productive and we continue to respond to the challenges facing New Yorkers, including price gouging, including individuals who are selling false products, individuals who claim that they have got a cure for COVID-19 uh, um, potions and lotions and even toothpaste individuals um, are marketing as cures for COVID-19 and there is no cure. 
Um, we have uh, essential workers reaching out to us, um, asking questions with respect to their level of work. We've responded to that. We've had a number of labor issues. We've had individuals marketing false PPE products. Um, and we've been responding obviously to the federal administration, to the Trump administration, which unfortunately um, um, has exercised no leadership um, and has fortunately uh, continues to engage in distractions um, and continues to pass rules and laws um, that are adverse uh, to most Americans um, and any policy that has been put forth by the former president, President Obama, this administration is committed to um, reversing. And at each and every turn, it's attorney generals all across this nation which are standing up for democracy. And my office has been leading on a number of initiatives um, and we're gonna continue to do that and stand up for our values as a nation and stand up for the rule of law, even if this president does not. Thank you. Can we bring all the panelists back and let's have a little discussion about the uh, protests? Because that's another been a, another big challenge in each of your cities in terms of responding to what has been happening on the ground after the death of uh, of George Floyd and uh, other people. So, who wants to start off talking about some of the leadership challenges you've faced in your positions relating to that? Let me just say that um, I will defend someone's right to march and I will guard it. I will guard that First Amendment right. That is my mission, that is my duty, and that is my responsibility. But I will not tolerate anyone engaging in violence on the streets of New York City or all across the state of New York. In addition to that, we will not invite and or welcome federal troops into New York State and or New York City. Policing is a local issue. It's an issue of a sovereign state. And, the, and unfortunately, um, the federal government is using nothing more, using these federal patrols um, uh, to distract us from his incompetence and his ability to lead. And so it's important that individuals understand that the law is both a sword and a shield, and we should use the law and, and as a sword and a shield to stand up to an administration which unfortunately ignores the rule of law. Attorney General James, uh, Mayor Cuomo, I mean, I'm sorry, Governor Cuomo appointed you to do an investigation on the treatment of protesters by the NYPD. And I know you've done a preliminary report. Is there anything that you can share that may be helpful to our NOVA members who are from other states as to you know the approach that was taken by the governor and whether that was a good idea to bring in the Attorney General's office? Yeah. I applaud Governor Cuomo. He tasked me with the responsibility of doing an independent report on NYPD, the handling of NYPD's um, of, of protesters during a period of time. We had a three-day hearing where I, where I heard from over 100 protesters, including the police commissioner. And the police commissioner of New York City, his testimony was totally at odds with that of the protesters. We issued a preliminary report and we are still conducting an engage and will issue a final report. The preliminary report basically urges that we democratize um, NYPD and our police force. Um, that we ban the chokehold as was done by the city council as well as the state legislature, that we give more power to CCRB, um, the Civilian Complaint Review Board, so that individuals can file complaints against police officers who engage in misconduct. We need more transparency and we need more accountability, but we need to democratize a police force, which unfortunately only answers to one individual, and that is the police commissioner. The police cannot police themselves. And it's important that we have accountability. And so my report um, obviously uh, will be shared, uh, has been shared with the governor as well as with the mayor and the city council for action, because that's why individuals are marching. They wanna be heard and they are demanding action. And it's really critically important that we reform NYPD because we cannot continue to do the same thing over and over again with the same result. And that result, unfortunately, is a loss of life of people of color. Yeah. Yeah. In the in the city of New Orleans, you know, I cannot say enough about the New Orleans Police Department. Uh, its leadership and I mean was displayed front and center uh, for the world to see as it relates to how we responded to our protesters in our city in which we we welcomed. We worked hand in hand uh, with them, with the protesters, provided equipment, um, traffic protection and the like. 
um, we were able to even stand in, in solidarity and saying, hey, we know that the eight can't wait because in the city of New Orleans, we embraced them years ago and, and went even further um, than, than what was being requested of law enforcement through uh, the, um, you know, through the protests happening. We absolutely could not and would not uh, stand for uh, any um, violent acts that were tied to uh, the protests. We had one incident um, where the agitators did uh, break uh, the line and my officers had to respond as trained. Uh, but everyone, um, we, we came out of that and um, continued to provide. Uh, the platform necessary for our people to rightfully uh, protest. And they did so even with their masks on and, and really did well. And they're still, we're still continuing to see protests throughout the city, but, but all are really peaceful. Um, not only, you know, upholding the eight can't wait and kind of using it as an opportunity to educate the public on how far uh, the New Orleans Police Department, how far we really have come. You know, from, um, you know, ethical policing is courageous. Epic is something that uh, our officers created right here in the city of New Orleans to de-escalate. And we're teaching it across uh, the country. And, and that's something that we're very proud of, uh, de-escalating um, any type of interaction. And, and that's what we do. Um, we also have multiple diversion programs, uh, alternatives to arrests, social workers and police districts. Um, in terms of the body worn cams we have, we um, created our own voluntary policy to release our footage uh, within 10 days. And I, I know that that's gone a long way in terms of building um, support in the community and building confidence, just really being transparent in how we interact uh, with our public. Um, cultural training classes for our recruits is essential. You know, uh, New Orleans is a special place and we do things a little bit differently and we talk with our hands and we, you know, our cultures are, are, are real. And so we wanted folks to, to truly understand if you want to serve our community, uh, then you have to, to know the language. And so being very intentional about that as well, you know, mandatory mental health checks uh, for our officers after police involved shootings. Um, this community um, voted uh, to change our charter, actually, uh, to create an independent police monitor that's been in place uh, since 2008 in our community. Uh, so really wanting uh, to ensure that that remains uh, and it does remain supported by uh, the public at large. So there are many uh, things that we're doing in the city of New Orleans that we were able to showcase um, where you, you couldn't make it up. And we responded uh, uh, with, with integrity, uh, with respect uh, for protesters, the respect for our people, and we'll continue to do that. Okay, we have a question that came from the audience uh, to Chief Davis. Somebody want, uh, sent out a question. So earlier you mentioned the importance of the duty to intervene. What are your thoughts on local law enforcement intervening against the actions taken by federal officers in our cities? Well, I think I think my colleagues on the uh, panel have also expressed that we are appalled that um, the feds would come in and really exacerbate an already volatile type of situation. And it's unfortunate that at this time, um, the real issues are being distracted because of the fact that we are now having to focus on how we deal with federal agents coming into our cities, trying to you know, take over work that local officials should be allowed to uh, manage. Um, unfortunately, um, this is occurring, uh, especially on the West Coast, and um, there's a lot of chatter about some of this occurring in other cities, and it's you know, imminent that, that it is to happen. But what has happened uh, effectively is that we've been distracted against the race about the racial issues uh, about what occurred with george floyd brianna taylor and so many other individuals away from the legislation that needs to be passed and now our focus is on how do we uh, ensure peace in our community so uh, i totally uh, feel that we need to continue to be strong and bold to our federal partners 
we have federal task forces and we, we partner well and don't have any problems with those issues that we invite our federal partners to assist us with, with crime reduction. That's what I need my federal partners to do, not come in and help me manage a protest. So I know I speak for many chiefs around uh, the country and I will take this time to also applaud um, Chief Ferguson for the work that, that he's done in New Orleans as well. Uh, our approach in, in Durham was very similar. We have had no protests with the exception of one about a week ago for weeks and weeks and weeks. We gave um, individuals the right to protest in our streets. We gave them the streets. And I equated it to, you know, when your children piss you off and make you angry about something, you send them to their rooms. And then when you see them, every time you see them after that incident, you get mad all over again. And that's the way I felt that protesters felt about police. They did not need to see police in riot gear. They did not need to see police in their faces. And once we started that approach and allowed people to peacefully protest, they continued that peaceful protesting posture. And uh, we've been uh, fortunate to allow that if they wanted the freeway, we gave them the freeway because there were no cars out there for them to stop. Once we, we shut down the freeway, they came off of the freeways. So um, I think strategizing and thinking in terms of, you know, the climate was really important. Okay, another question from the audience. As female leaders, have you experienced resistance of your vision to handle the protests from subordinate police officers? And what are some recent measures used to address it? I'll, I'll keep rolling on because right. now we, I'm very sensitive about that issue. And, and that's what uh, re was revealed to me about our law enforcement officers. Sometimes they want to engage during times when we really have to put on our, our, our thinking caps about what is the best way for us to have a win-win for everybody. And it's not always about engaging protesters and you have to know what the capacity of your police department is to engage in that type of activity there's no way that my police department would have been able to continue for days and days uh fighting protesters the the best thing to do is to evaluate every situation and i've had to have these conversations with them because they were so used to getting out there putting on that gear and and being the police, as opposed to allowing people to have space, allow them to um, exercise their First Amendment rights, because they had every reason to be, to be angry. And police officers were angry about what happened to George Floyd. So yeah. the last thing we needed to do was be part of this whole physical violence and physical kind of encounter. Yeah. OK, yeah. I want you to keep the questions. Did somebody else want to say anything on I, that one? I want to thank um, members of uh, NYPD who took a knee um, and who joined in uh, conversations with the protesters. Again, I will defend their right to protest and I will guard it. Um, I will not protect the right of anarchists or individuals who wanted to take advantage of a system uh, of, a, of a, a crisis, unfortunately. And uh, those gang members, um, those individuals obviously should be apprehended and should be um, arrested and prosecuted. Uh, but most of the individuals, the vast majority of the individuals who took to the streets in New York, in New York City and all across the state of New York were peaceful protesters. And they march even to this day. Um, not too far from where I live is Barclays Arena. And that has become the town center uh, where individuals go uh, to address and, and to um, put forth their grievances to government. And they should be heard. All that they want to do is be heard. And they want to make sure that there is change. And it's important that this be um, a teaching moment. Individuals must understand that the civil rights movement, the boycott in Montgomery, Alabama, lasted a year. And so people cannot complain about these protesters and ask the question, what do they want? They want fundamental change. They want to democratize and they want to hold law enforcement uh, accountable uh, for their actions. And there are some individuals, uh, some officers with, um, in police forces who really should either leave the force, be retrained and or disciplined. 
Most recently in New York State, the state legislature passed a law which would release disciplinary records of police officers. It's currently in litigation because the unions have filed lawsuits. It's important that individuals understand that we need to release the discipline records that have been substantiated uh, against police officers. And we need to, again, make sure that we have a database of those officers who engage in a pattern and practice of misconduct so that they can be disciplined and are removed from the force. And lastly, in New York City, the police commissioner should not be the sole arbiter of uh, disciplinary actions. It's uh, something that we have called for and something that I'm urging uh, that we reform here in New York City. And uh, again, I applaud the members of the police force. I work with them every day. I've attended their funerals. I recognize uh, the, a difficult job that they have, but I will stand up and defend the rights of protesters and all of those who want to submit, who want to air their grievances publicly uh, on the streets of New York City in a peaceful manner. Absolutely. I and want to ask, go ahead. Go, go on there. No, go ahead. I was gonna bring up another question. I want to ask each of you, what kind of advice do you give to younger people who may be interested in uh, pursuing a career similar to yours? I would say get involved. You know, you're never too young. And that's what I really do tell uh, young people throughout the city of New Orleans. I tell them my story um, and then you have a voice right now, you know, and what you do today will ultimately determine the life that you're going to live. And you don't, um, if, if it's in you, that, that fire and just opening up for me, um, a city government to young people. I created a, a junior civic leadership academy for young, for young students throughout the city. Uh, I have about, uh, I believe, 40 in my cohort now, but just continuing to engage them and make them a part of and let them know they can be a part of the solution. But listening, listening to them, I think is, is the best as well. But we have to encourage them. And I know that these protests that have happened, I'm telling you, they really have um, uh, built the, the, the momentum and people, the young people feel like it's their time and it is. I teach class. Um, I teach class um, to individuals uh, usually on Mondays. And uh, now there's been calls for me to teach another class. I also work very closely with sororities and fraternities um, all throughout New York City and New York State. And I teach them a lot about the law. I also teach them about the color of law. I also teach them um, about slave codes. I teach them about Jim Crow. I teach them about reconstruction. I teach them about property rights. I teach them about restrictive covenants. I teach them about the civil rights movement. I teach them um, about uh, uh, the equal protection laws and all of the laws on the book and how it has been embedded with racism. Um, but I also teach them about the power that lies within their hands, the power to make a difference, the power to stand up and speak truth to power, and the, and the power to step out of the shadow and into the sunlight and to think about others before you think about yourselves. Mm -hmm. And we have and a I question. Just, yeah. What I would say to add to that is that, um, you know, during these recent weeks, I think people thought that there would be um, a decline in the interest in the criminal justice field or even in law enforcement. And we have seen, actually we've seen the opposite. So I encourage uh, our, our, our young people to continue to look uh, for careers in law enforcement because you're who we need. We need mm -hmm. individuals that understand that Law enforcement is um, a, a career that is more of a, should be more of an altruistic uh, culture uh, uh, to, to engage. But, you know, if we don't get people who understand their communities, people who are from the community, a diverse group of um, recruits, then, you know, we'll continue to hire individuals that don't have a sense of concern and care in communities of color. And I know people, uh, talk about the one bad apple, but in this career field, we can't afford to have one bad apple. We um, have to root out individuals that don't understand the importance of empathy and understanding community. And the last thing I'll say is this is um, uh, one of the classes that our recruits are now required to take is a history class. And it's not about U.S. history. It's about the history of the community in which they 
have agreed and will be sworn to serve so that they can understand better some of the historical injustices that occurred right there in those communities, some of the um, in, in, injustices and indignities that um, uh, men and women of black and brown um, race have experienced so that when they get out on the street, they have a better understanding of why there is an angst about the uniform. And it doesn't matter if the person is, is an African-American police officer or a white police officer. Right. right now, people look at the uniform as this, this oppressive type of symbol that has caused historical injustice from generation to generation. So uh, here in the city of Durham, the movie, um, The Worst of Enemies, um, that movie being a, a, a true story is one that we share. And not only that, we are also starting to share the history, the rich history of the community here so our officers better understand. Yeah, the point you just made about uh, the things that are happening now, and many people thought it would be running people away from law enforcement. One of the things that I have found in some of the studies I've done is that people get attracted to law enforcement when they think they can make a difference. Mm -hmm. And when they maybe see some opportunity for, uh, for change in an agency. So I think the whole discussion around reform and change within police departments might attract more young people. And so many black people go into law enforcement, not because they've never had a bad experience with law enforcement, but they go there because they have had a bad experience and they wanna be the change that they wanna see within the agencies. So, uh, so I think we are almost out of time. I want to uh, thank our panelists uh, for their participation. Usually this panel is just focused on police, women police officers. And I thought, I think it was a good, it was a good change this year to bring in some other women who interact within the criminal justice field, but are not police officers. I think it made for a rich conversation. And I want to thank, uh, well, I think I have, they say I have a few more minutes, so and we we'll give a chance for each of you to give a final closing remarks. So Dr. Scott, I'm going to be real short. Vote, vote, vote. Democracy is on the ballot. Everyone come out to vote and everyone please fill out the census. The census response is low. The census is tied to reapportionment, to tied to our representatives and it's tied to how much money we get back from Washington, DC. Vote, vote November, no matter what they put in your way, no matter what obstacles, vote for decency and for normalcy and fill out the census. God bless you and thank you. And Mayor, final comment. Well, thank you all for having me. And Attorney General, you have been the most inspiring. And Chief Davis, thank you so much. I've learned um, some things from you all uh, on this panel. I have to agree, you know, with the Attorney General. One, uh, absolutely vote. But in the city of New Orleans, I'm telling you, I'm hitting this census really hard as well. This is going to be what I call our first real census since 2000. Uh, in 2010, our people were still scattered, you know, all over uh, the country and um, where we had 43 percent of our folks responded. So we're pushing very hard. But right now we're at about 54 uh, percent, but we're on the ground trying to turn it out so that we can get additional resources. We all need them in our environments throughout the country. So I would say, please, please, please encourage people to respond. You know, nine questions, 10 minutes. And of course, uh, exercise your right uh, to vote. It's so important. But thank you so much for this opportunity and this platform. And I would be remiss if I didn't thank Noble for always being there for my New Orleans Police Department and our leadership. We really do appreciate you. And I know uh, that my chief, Chief Ferguson, really appreciates um, you all and the support that you give him. Chief Davis. Absolutely. I just want to personally thank uh, both H.G. E. James and Mayor Cantrell. I have personally been inspired. That's why it's so important for us to continue these types of, these types of conversations. 
And of course, Dr. Scott, you're always at levels of excellence that just, just is unparalleled. So thank you so much for moderating. I can't reiterate more, and I'm going to speak on behalf of our first VP who's coming in um, in just a few hours, to tell you the truth. And that's all she's been talking about. Linda Williams, the next president of Noble, has talked about voting. So I know she's going to bust through the gates with um, this charge and a campaign, and we look forward to that. But we can't reiterate how important it is that if we want change, meaningful change, we have to get people out to the polls to put people in positions that can help effectuate that change. So again, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Elsie. Thank, no, thank okay, you. Thank, thank you, Dr. Scott. Thank each of our speakers. Uh, Attorney General James, I tried to get you to come and speak at, uh, at Howard, but you had just gotten elected, so you really didn't have time. And uh, a lot of people have been waiting to see what's going to happen with uh, the indictment of the president on some charges in New York. But I just say to each of you, to each of you, to keep doing what you're doing and keep exercising the leadership that you have, because you're really making so many young black women see that there's an opportunity. You know, so many of them are proud when they turn on the TV and see black women speaking, black women in charge, and black women not embarrassing us out there. So uh, again, vote. That was in my final comments that you need to get out to vote. And I'm glad you brought up about the census because we definitely need to be a part of the census. And there are there's at least, I think about 60 women running for Congress, black women running for Congress. So women are running, need to find them, and vote for them and make sure we get the type of leaders that we have on this panel. So I wanna thank Noble for allowing me to moderate. I wanna thank our sponsor, Thompson Rhodes, for sponsoring this panel and uh, thank everybody who participated. Sorry, we didn't have a chance to take more questions, but we only had an hour. So thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, see you later.